this is a, an introduction to the clinical interpretation of immunogenicity. I'm going to talk about the general principles for clinical interpretation. And on part one, well, this is divided in five parts, I'm going to talk about the introduction and what is immunogenicity. When interpreting data, I recommend avoid using opinions, and it's not just my recommendation. As regards any subject we propose to investigate, we must inquire not what other people have thought. Well, now, let me read that again. We must inquire not what other people have thought or what we ourselves conjecture, but what we can clearly and manifestly perceive by intuition or deduce with certainty. René Descartes, in the Rules for the Direction of the Mind, this is rule number three. I recommend you to read all of them. They're really uh, very, very good. And even though they were written in the 17th century, they really pertain to any scientist who is trying to interpret data and understand what the message behind the data is giving us. Men have sought to make a world from their own conception and to draw from their own minds all the material which they employed. But instead of doing so, if they had consulted experience and observation, they would have the facts and not the opinions to reason about and might have ultimately arrived at the knowledge of the laws which govern the material world. Sir Francis Bacon the great installation, not surprisingly contemporary to Descartes, because this is the 17th century in Europe, is the time of the illustration. So four centuries later, I encourage everybody to make sure that we go back to these rules and we try to avoid using opinions and make sure that we draw conclusions, deducing with certainty based on the observation and on the data. What are the most common mistakes that I recommend you to avoid when interpreting immunogenicity? And again, this might be from the clinical uh, perspective, and this could be either if you're seeing a patient, but mostly when you are interpreting data from either package inserts or the uh, instructions for use uh, for the different drugs for your patients or from clinical trials. Immunogenicity equals ADA test results. Now, the way that I've seen this written is, if there are no anti-drug antibodies, then the drug is not immunogenic. The anti-drug antibody assays provides unequivocal positive or negative results. In other words, you know, people see the results and they believe they are true positive or true negatives. Anti-drug antibodies always interfere with PK. Another way I've seen this written is, if the PK is not decreased, there are no anti-drug antibodies in the samples. And sometimes people say, well, why waste our time checking if there's anti-drug antibodies if the PK is okay? Anti-drug antibodies impact pharmacodynamic and efficacy endpoints are detected by neutralizing antibody tests. In other words, a lot of concepts I've seen go back to the concept of saying the anti-drug antibodies that have neutralizing activity are the only anti-drug antibodies that can decrease the function or the efficacy of the drug. Anti-drug antibodies always interfere with function. Other way that I've seen this is if there is no decrease in efficacy, there are no anti-drug antibodies, and hence there's no point in uh, testing the blood of the patients for anti-drug antibodies because they're doing okay in terms of efficacy. If the anti-drug antibody titers are low, there are no neutralizing anti antibodies. Baseline anti-drug antibodies are not important. Exclude these subjects from analysis. So I will be answering all these questions and the rationale why I'm saying these are mistakes during the uh, series that I have posted in the YouTube channel uh, for immunogenicity. There is a playlist and I encourage you, if you have questions about why any of these are not real, uh, 
you can either do Google searches for scientific uh, publications, but you could also go to my YouTube channel, subscribe, and check some of the other videos that explain these in more detail. Immunogenicity is a property that enables a substance, such as a drug, to provoke an immune response. So when we start um, in this response, we have the therapeutic protein or the drug. This drug is actually presented or seen by what we know as an antigen presenting cell. This antigen presenting cell is most likely a dendritic cell. The majority of them are dendritic cells, although other cells can act as antigen presenting cells. Like the B cells, the B cells can also be antigen presenting cells. The characteristic of these cells is that they can see the whole protein, they can engulf it, and then they can present it to the T cell, but they don't present the whole molecule. They present only the T cell epitope that the T cell will recognize and become activated. This activation of the T cell is usually accompanied by a differentiation into one of the three major Th phenotypes that will then act upon either the neutrophils, the eosinophils, or the macrophages. I encourage you to see the Th phenotype YouTube video that I recently posted that explains in more detail this response. For this particular talk on immunogenicity, the important point here is that an antigen presenting cell that could be a B cell or a dendritic cell then activates the T cell and this T cell will differentiate into activating or helping the activation of the actual effector cells that will deal with the antigen, in this case, will deal with the drug. This is what we know as the cellular immune response. The cells are actually going to deal or destroy either the drug or the drug that has been engulfed by a cell, and they would kill that cell. On the other hand, an activated T cell can also produce cytokines that stimulate these B cells. So the B cell was acting before as an antigen presenting cell, but if the T cell goes back and stimulates that B cell with the appropriate messages or cytokines, this B cell will actually respond with maturation and differentiation, activation of these B cells means that they will eventually become plasma cells and they can produce cytokines, but they also, most importantly, produce the antibodies. These antibodies are going to be directed to the drug. So the interesting thing here is that the B cell can see the whole protein that presents the T cell epitope that has been digested by the, by the B cell to the T cell. The T cell activates that B cell and the B cell produces antibodies that are not limited to the T cell epitope. They can bind any part of that therapeutic protein or antigen. On the second part of these general principles for the clinical interpretation of immunogenicity, we're going to discuss the immune response to drugs as antigens. And the response from the immune system to therapeutic drugs that act as antigens includes innate and adaptive immune responses that are no different from the innate and adaptive immune response to any other kind of perceived danger. Let's revise the innate and adaptive immunity. And I want to first mention, this is taken from Abbas et al, Basic Immunology. Uh, Abbas, Lickman, and P.I. are excellent professors. I encourage you to look at their different books and materials. So this is taken from their Basic Immunology course. So let's look at the innate immunity on the left. And let's talk about the specificity, which is one of the key differentiators between innate and adaptive immunity. 
So the first thing that you need to see here is that the three cells depicted in green are the same cell with the identical same innate immune system receptor. In this case, it's called a toll-like receptor. It could be a mannose receptor. There are several different kinds of immune receptors of the innate system. But the idea is it's exactly the same receptor, it's exactly the same cell, and the same cell can actually identify different microbes, different pathogens via either the PAMPs, which are the pathogen associated molecular patterns. So what is this? This is, for instance, a lipopolysaccharide or certain amounts of mannose, which the human cells or the mammalian cells do not produce. So there are things that are unique to microbes or to external potential danger signals that are pathogen associated molecular patterns, so the PAMPs. Or the other thing is the DAMPs, the damage associated molecular patterns. So a very, very quick example. When we cut ourselves, for instance, we're going to cut some cells and then we will have the nuclear content or the cytosolic content of our own cells, like, you know, the DNA or the RNA, now it's actually free in the bloodstream. And these cells in green will actually detect our own RNA or DNA, but that's a signal that there's danger, something happened. And the innate system has to deal with that particular issue by creating, you know, fibrosis and creating all the immune response that heals that particular cut or burn. So the damps are damage associated molecular patterns, which are things that may be normal in our own system, but they should not be exposed to the cells of the innate system. And the PAMPs are definitely not human. They're identified as pathogen associated molecular patterns. So for dealing with the trillions of different kind of messages that could cause damage, we have a very quick line of defense of the immune system in the, in the innate immune system that with the same receptors, they have actually created these receptors to identify things that should not be there. So they're identifying patterns, gross patterns that shouldn't be there. On the other hand, for the adaptive immune system, now we have distinct, it's not receptors with, let's call them antibody molecules, but they could also be T-cell receptors. So in the adaptive immunity, you have different receptors and they identify different pieces of the pathogens. So in this particular depiction, you can actually see that the same three images for the different microbes in this cartoon on the left on the innate system they're identifying the purple goblets which were commonly found in all of them whereas on the right the adaptive immune system now is recognizing either a square or a triangle or a little system like a y letter that are unique to that particular pathogen. So the difference is that in the adaptive immune system, there's a specificity for the structural detail that will identify each one of these pathogens different. So innate system actually identifies many different pathogens with the same receptors. The adaptive immunity or the adaptive immune system will do the very selective and specific identification for each one of these microbes or antigens. If we move down on this table, it's important to understand the receptors, which is in a way what I was mentioning. So for the innate system, and I encourage you to see other uh, videos, I have other ones on the innate system, but you can also check uh, videos or more in-depth innate system responses. But in a in a summarized way, let's just see that we have basically, like I mentioned, the toll-like receptors that will identify uh, very common uh, shared patterns by microbes, either PAMPs or DAMPs. We have the mannose receptors. We'll, we'll identify 
a level of manose that is not normally produced by our own system. Our system does not incorporate the manose uh, as large as bacteria do or other pathogens. Then we also have the NOD-like receptors. These are in the cytosol. So an important thing is that the innate system has uh, the ability to have these receptors that are encoded in the germ line. They are there since we are born and they can identify these patterns both on the surface of the cell or in the cytosol, and they will deal with many different perceived danger signals. The receptors of the adaptive system, as I mentioned before, are either the uh, immunoglobulins or the antibodies that have actually mutated, and now they identify the specific details of that microbe that they are learning to deal with, or the T cell receptor, which is germline encoded, but uh, they have a recombination systems for the genes that produce a great variety of specificity so that they're also uniquely identifying that detail of each one of these perceived danger signals. So very different, one of them is germline, never changes, uh, could be in the expression on the cell surface or in the cytosol for the innate system. For the adaptive system, we can actually secrete them out like the antibodies, or we can keep them on the cell surface like the T cell receptors, but they have actually the ability to have somatic mutations and to have recombination so that they allow for more detailed and specific identification of the microbes. Now, importantly is this distribution of the receptors. While the innate system is non-clonal, so there's identical receptors everywhere, it's polyclonal, many, many different uh, lineages have exactly the same receptor. In the case of the adaptive system, there's a learning where a few clones are the ones that will be mutated and will be committing to identifying that particular detail of the danger signal perceived. The relationship in time between the innate and the adaptive immunity is also important to know. So when you have an antigen, the innate immunity will first deal with it by with the epithelial barrier. So we may be in contact with the antigen through the respiratory system, the uh, GI system, the skin, or if this is a drug, it could be via the uh, uh, intradermal, subcutaneous, or intravenous injection. So whichever it is, the first encounter with the antigen, the innate immunity will have the epithelial barriers that can deal with it if it's a perceived danger. And then we have also the mast cells when uh, you have an engagement of a Th2 phenotype. I do have a video that explains the Th phenotypes in more depth. You can have cells that phagocytize that antigen or dendritic cells that can also deal with that antigen. And different kinds of cells could also engage the complement system, which is also in the innate immunity um, area or scope. And also finally, they can have the NK cells and the ILCs that actually will kill the cell that carries that antigen. This is a very quick response. If you are actually giving a drug to a patient or you're in an emergency room setting and a patient comes in with severe symptoms of anaphylactic reaction or allergic reactions, you know that's within the first hours is when the patient is going to have this innate immunity response. It can be severe, it can be serious, like an anaphylactic reaction. And it can be accompanied by rash, uh, itchiness, you know, it can be vomiting, can be shortness of breath, can be many different kinds of symptoms of an acute reaction to that antigen. And this is the innate system protecting you from that antigen. Now, the innate system can also react in a subclinical way. Uh, the individual, the patient might actually show very mild symptoms of a reaction and they may not even come to you as a doctor to explain these symptoms. It could be retrospective when they actually see that the adaptive system has come in. 
So when the antigen persists, if the innate system has been subclinically dealing with it, what happens is the adaptive immune system can kick in. So the first area of the adaptive immune system that I want to explain here is the B lymphocytes. Now the B lymphocytes can feed the whole antigen. They can actually react to this antigen and if driven appropriately by the Th cells, then they can mature and they can produce antibodies. These antibodies will identify the antigen. They are very specific. These plasma cells can be short-lived or they can have long-lived plasma cells for memory cells. But these antibodies are going to bind the whole antigen in different places. They don't bind always the same epitope. They could bind different epitopes of that antigen, but they basically will opsonize it and will make sure that we can clear up the body from this antigen. The other aspect of the adaptive immunity is when the antigen presenting cells, which could be a dendritic cell, like it's depicted here, but the B lymphocytes can also present antigens to the T lymphocytes. These T lymphocytes will actually uh, are depicted here as CD8 lymphocytes, which are activated as effector cells, and they can kill directly the cells that have the antigen. So the effector T cells will actually also kill the antigen. Now in terms of the timing, it's important that these are delayed reactions. And the other very typical manifestation of the adaptive immune system is that it has memory, whereas the innate immunity does not have memory. So the innate immunity is always present, it can deal with many pathogens, whereas the adaptive immune system is created specifically by exposure to a very particular antigen. It is more potent and also it has memory. The part three of this clinical interpretation of immunogenicity general principles is dedicated to understanding the B cell response. So after we have reviewed uh, the innate system, the adaptive system, and within the adaptive system, we have T cell and B cell responses. Let's take a look at the B cell response to drugs as antigens. When we have therapeutic drugs that act as antigens, the B cell response is again no different than a B cell response to a pathogen. The immunogenicity B cell response is the one that we're going to explain right now, which is the response from the B cell. It can react to the complete drug, to the whole antigen. So the B cells can identify the whole antigen. They can then digest it and present the T cell epitope directly to the T cell to activate it. And the B cells respond to these activated T cells. So when the T cells are presented, either from the B cell or from a dendritic cell, a particular epitope that comes from a drug, they can then produce cytokines that stimulate the B cells. These B cells will become activated and they secrete cytokines themselves like interleukin-6 or TNF, and they can also develop or differentiate into plasma cells that eventually will produce the antibodies. But an important part of this whole T cell activation is the production, the B cell response of memory B cells. Now, not all of the immunogenic responses will have memory, but if they do, it is very important for us to understand if the patient is presenting with a primary response, which is the first activation of the B cells with anti-drug antibodies, but they could disappear or if it's a secondary response where these antibodies will always be there and will always be secreted whenever there's new exposure to the antigen. So the B cell response to the drug is what we know as the anti-drug antibody induction. Let's review what is the primary and the secondary B cell responses. This is taken from 
Abbas Lickman and Pilar. Cellular Molecular Immunology, excellent professors and teachers. If you have an opportunity to either read their materials or attend their uh, workshops and seminars, I encourage you to do it. So when we have a first uh, infection uh, or first encounter with the antigen, we have a naive T cell that will recognize the whole antigen. And basically what happens is that this will become activated. The activation will actually make them differentiate into plasma cells and the typical results of this plasma cell over time will be short-lived plasma cells with production of mainly IgM antibodies to the antigen. So a few things that are important from this cartoon is how fast does this response occur? This is an adaptive response and it's delayed. It depends on purpose. There's no uh, units on these graphs because it depends on the antigen and also depends on the amount of antigen that the body is seeing that you are going to be able to detect anti-drug antibody or antibodies to the antigen if it's not a drug on this scale but you actually will see uh, a, a significant increase from the baseline from when the patient starts responding so there is at least fourfold or fivefold increase in the titers when they get to have the maximum response the other thing that's critical to understand is that they're mainly IgM antibodies. There may be a small amount of IgG antibodies in what we know as primary B cell response. What happens later is that there's the uh, long-lived plasma cells in the bone marrow will actually make the titers go down not to the level before the exposure with antigen, but to a much lower level, let's say about threefold lower than what the maximal response was. This whole first uh, graph could be 30 days. It could be that the maximal response is within 15 days. And then by day 30, you see still the remaining of antibodies when there's long lived plasma cells in the bone marrow. They also can cause memory B cells. So if we're talking about a vaccination or if we're talking about a pathogen uh, like hepatitis B or if you're talking about um, any kind of drug that could cause this response, the times could be different. They could be longer or they could be shorter. But basically what you know is that the highest titers are about three times higher than the ones that will remain in the blood if there's a memory lingering uh, memory response. If not, then they would go back to baseline and basically would be a primary response and not become secondary response. The secondary response is seen when we now have um, these memory B cells in the system, and there's a repeat exposure to the antigen. So this could be a second dose of a particular drug, or it could be a repeat infection, or when we have a vaccine that needs a second immunization, because we do know that the responses to some vaccinations require several injections to build up the appropriate adaptive B cell response to them. That's the case, for instance, of hepatitis B, but it could also be for tetanus toxoid. So for several different conditions, we do need to make sure that we have a secondary response, or in the cases that we don't want more exposure, we could identify if the patient has created a memory response when we give a second dose of a particular drug to the patient. If the patient has memory cells, these cells very quickly will differentiate into the plasma cells. So there's two important things in the secondary response reaction. Number one, titers. The titer booster is a significant increase 
uh, to anywhere between three and ten fold higher than what is seen on the primary response. The other thing is that it does take a shorter time to get this peak response, and that's by design. We have mounted an adaptive B cell response to deal with a potential danger, so we actually have a higher amount faster. And the other thing that's important is that this is IgG. You will not have IgM antibodies because they were mature cells. And then we do have the persistence of long-lived plasma cells, the bone marrow, and the memory B cells, which is a very critical aspect of the adaptive immune system. So the adaptive system has memory. And you can see that the baseline after a secondary response now, the baseline titers of the antibodies is at least twice higher, twofold higher than the memory response we had after the primary response. So when an individual develops a, a secondary response in terms of the visa response and antibodies, the titers will be higher than they were before. These are all things that you need to consider when you are seeing your patients and you want to determine the level of antibodies that they have and you want to understand if it's a primary response or if there's a memory secondary response to deal with it appropriately. So for the B cell response, when we're lo looking at anti-drug antibodies, uh, you need to understand the time of response. Is this a primary response? you can take a look at the anti-drug antibodies, but you need to understand when the samples were taken. So if you're looking at an individual, it's a bit more difficult. This is easier when you have clinical trial results. In some of the package inserts, when you read if a particular new drug, for instance, is gonna uh, have the risk of anti-drug antibodies, uh, take a look in the insert and see if the information tells you when those anti-drug antibodies were tested. If you want to know if your patient has a potential anti-drug antibody uh, raised to a particular drug and you want to consider giving that patient the drug, make sure that you understand when the tests were taken in relation to when the patient was exposed to the drug. So you can actually have a pretty good idea. Is this a primary response? Um, is there low titers? Are they stable? And basically you have to see that there's no titer booster. Now, if it's a secondary response, you will have an idea if the patient was uh, given the drug more than once and what happened uh, after the second time in terms of isotype switch, because you will not see IgM antibodies, you will see basically IgGs, uh, and you will also see a titer booster. A very important thing about the isotype switching for anti-drug antibodies is that they could go all the way switching, not just from IgM to IgG, but on the secondary response, they could go all the way to IgA, especially if the respiratory or the GI system are involved, or even IgE creating a potential anaphylactic response. So all of that is important. If you have access to the information, it's important for you to understand it and know how to interpret it. Part four of the clinical interpretation immunogenicity general principles is for you to understand the antibody structure and function, and then understand when the drugs are reacting as antigens and they build an antibody response to them. Because it is, it's a bit tricky. So in the next few minutes of this talk, you will see what I mean by explaining the antibody response to the drugs, understanding the antibody structure and function and what can an anti-drug antibody do to the individual and how to interpret. So when we look at anti-drug antibodies, I want to first discuss a little bit or uh, touch upon the structure and function of antibodies because this uh, topic is a bit complex, especially if our drug is an antibody and we have an anti-drug antibody, it's an antibody antibody 
to an antibody. And we can get lost in our chain of thoughts because uh, it's almost like looking into mirrors that are facing each other. So we just need to pause and identify what exactly are we seeing? Which of the two antibodies are we talking about? It is important to know that when we have a, a therapeutic protein, a drug that is antigenic, we have a variety of potential uh, structures that we're dealing with. So if you look at this particular cartoon, the first uh, list there, aspirin is not a protein, of course. Uh, it's just uh, starting from the size of the aspirin, considering that uh, 1x size, which is 0.18 kilodalton, uh, you can see the proportion of the size just in terms of the molecular weight of the potential drugs that we use that could be produced in bacteria or yeast on the left. And you go from the smallest, that could be a peptide like calcitonin, to proteins and eventually more complex proteins uh, that have no sugars because they are produced in bacteria or yeast. Uh, the fact uh, that I'm highlighting the element of sugar is because it adds a complexity to the quaternary structure of that drug and it does uh, produce potentially more uh, antigenic elements on this particular complex protein. So the more complex it is, uh, the more probability we have of having a particular part or epitope of that drug to be seen as a potential danger signal by the immune system and mount an immune response to it. When we move to the mammalian produced uh, drugs, uh, now we have the addition of potential glycoproteins, you know, sugars added to this protein. And as I mentioned, that adds another level of complexity into the structure of these drugs that can potentially be seen as immunogenic. Now, don't uh, interpret this as saying that the more we go to the left, the less immunogenic they can be. The immunogenic response could be infrequent, but it could be lethal. So the fact that you can have a rare instance of an immune response to a smaller molecule because there's less elements that can actually mount an immune response, it doesn't necessarily mean that that immune response in particular could be uh, dramatic, could be a, a serious adverse event, and it could be death threatening event. So the reason why I'm putting this here is just to explain there's a complexity to these drugs, uh, but ultimately the response of the immune system is idiosyncratic and we need to make sure we can interpret it as, you know, in a case by case basis. In order to understand better the interactions between a drug that's a protein drug and antibody function, I, I just want to go through this cartoon and walk you through it uh, in a logical way. So we normally have a, a cell with membrane receptors and you have a situation with a soluble ligand that binds a membrane receptor. So when we use a drug to block this particular interaction, the drug can be either an antibody, depicted here as uh, the green and blue molecule, or it can be a non-antibody protein, depicted here with orange and dark red. And that particular drug can bind either the soluble ligand or the membrane receptor. Now, the important thing that I'm showing in this particular cartoon is where they bind. So let's look at binding the triangular image there, which is a soluble ligand. What I'm putting in here is that the drug is binding precisely the piece of that soluble ligand that identifies and engages with the membrane receptor. So our drug is acting as a true blocking agent of this particular function. On the other hand, if our drug is now binding a membrane receptor, what I have depicted here is a binding exactly in the groove 
of that receptor that literally is occupying the receiving piece of the membrane receptor and it doesn't allow the soluble ligand to work. So this is uh, in a nutshell what happens with our drugs that are protein drugs. I just have to mention that the effect of that binding on the membrane receptor uh, does block the soluble ligand from engaging it. But the resulting effect on the cell could be either an inhibition of that pathway or a promotion of that pathway. So depending if we actually have uh, analogs to the endogenous proteins that will engage that receptor and make the cell more active, or we have inhibitors that bind that particular receptor on the membrane and could actually inhibit the final effect that the soluble ligand engagement normally produces. But for the sake of this particular explanation, uh, the important thing that I'm showing here is that the drug blocks the binding of the soluble ligand, the natural soluble ligand, to the membrane receptor. So now we have a drug which can be an antibody or it can be a protein. And the antibody here is depicted in green and blue, uh, the uh, therapeutic protein in orange and dark red. So it is binding either uh, the soluble ligand or it's binding the membrane receptor. But now we have antibodies to the drug. So when that antibody to the drug is binding the site that is the functional site of the drug, the site that precisely will produce the binding either to the soluble ligand or to the membrane receptor, what happens is that we do not have that blockade anymore. And then the soluble ligand is able and capable of binding a membrane receptor. Both of them are now free to work as usual. So an anti-drug antibody that is binding the functional part of the drug, either an antibody FAB portion or the piece of the protein that actually is binding the ligand or the membrane receptor, this anti-drug antibody will neutralize that particular function of the drug. So it's as if we were not giving the drug at all. The uh, normal interaction will be happening without any effects. And this is the case when we have neutralizing antibodies. Now, antibodies have other functions, not only the binding of their target. And I want to review those functions because they are pertinent to both cases. When our drug is an antibody, we may have other functions of that antibody outside the antibody binding site, which is the FAB portion of the drug. Uh, but also, if we have anti-drug antibodies in both cases, these antibodies also have functions that are outside their binding site. So let's review first the complement dependent cytotoxicity. When an antibody binds the surface of a cell and produces a cluster of receptors of that particular immunoglobulin, then this clustering will bring or will attract the complement complex and it will begin the complement cascade of events that eventually literally drill a hole in a cell membrane and produce the death of that cell. So that is the complement dependent cytotoxicity or cytolysis.
So now I'm going to ask you to follow what I'm saying. I don't have animation for this particular narration, but let's now think that our drug is binding the receptor, but our drug is not an antibody. However, there's an anti-drug antibody to that drug. So the drug is bound to the receptor and if it's not an antibody, it will not produce a complement cascade. However, if there is an anti-drug antibody to that particular drug that's bound to the cell membrane, we could potentially have a CDC effect uh, that is derived from directly the immunogenicity of that particular drug. So, in other words, any drug antibodies could bind outside. They're not neutralizing because they are allowing the drug to bind the receptor. So the anti-drug antibody is binding outside the neutralizing site, but it is binding that particular drug that is engaged with the receptor and it produces a cluster of receptors that triggers a CDC response, which is not to be expected. So that's the case when we do not have an antibody as a drug. Next, when we do have an antibody as a drug, it's a bit more tricky because is as if part of the efficacy of that drug may be the CDC activation, like in the case of rituximab. So when you have an antibody to a receptor that will normally be not only binding the receptor, that's the antibody function, but through the FC portion, it will actually activate the complement cascade and produce the cell death of the lymphoma cells, for instance. So this could be part of your mechanism of action of your drug. And if you have an anti-drug antibody that is not neutralizing, it is acting outside the FAB of your drug antibody. So your drug antibody is capable of binding the target, which is the receptor on the cells. But you have now an anti-drug antibody that could potentially be blocking the area of the FC portion that activates the, the cascade of the complement activation. So in this case, your mechanism of action would you be expecting cell death, but by having anti-drug antibodies, you could have less efficacy and they are not neutralizing antibodies. It's through the complement activation that they are decreasing the ability to have the mechanism of action working. So this is a very important concept because when you do testing, we will see that in part three of the immunogenicity series, part two, I'm sorry. Um, when you look at testing for neutralizing antibodies, uh, all we're testing is the ability to bind the target. Uh, we're not testing this ability, but this can cause either loss of efficacy and it's not neutralizing antibody, or it could also have effect on safety. The next function of the antibody that is through the FC portion is what we call the ADCC. So again, I'm going to be doing the same kind of explanation as before. So we have a receptor on the cell and let's say that your particular drug binds the receptor efficiently. And now you have antibodies to your drug. So if your drug is not an antibody, it would normally not produce antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity because this is dependent on the FC receptor. And the FC receptor in the effector cell, which is a killer cell that will release cytotoxins and by those cytotoxins kill the cell, 
that FC receptor is only present in antibodies. So when your drug is not an antibody and it is binding the cells, you would not expect that drug to have ADCC effects at all. When you have an anti-drug antibody and your drug is bound to the cell membrane, this anti-drug antibody could actually have an FC receptor that engages with the effector cell and produces antibody drug dependent cytotoxicity. So this can happen in cases where your drug is not an antibody. If your drug is an antibody, then this could be part of the drug's mechanism of action. Going back to the example of rituximab, uh, this is one of the mechanism of actions of rituximab also. Not only the FC portion can activate the complement complex, but it can also bind effector cells and produce release of cytotoxins and kill the cell by that other way. So when we have anti-drug antibodies and the drug is an antibody that is supposed to have also ADCC as mechanism of action, the anti-drug antibody, which is not neutralizing because it's allowing your drug to bind the target on the membrane, when you have these anti-drug antibodies binding the FC portion of your drug, they could block the ADCC effect that you would be expecting from your drug. So in this case, the effects on efficacy could be a decrease in efficacy, but it's not a neutralizing antibody. So to have a decrease in efficacy on particular drugs where you would be expecting them to produce CDC and ADCC cyto cytolysis, your anti-drug antibodies could decrease that particular effect and they could also be non-neutralizing antibodies. They don't need to be neutralizing to block this effect through the FC portion. Similar situation happens with the other effect of the FC portion, and this is in the case of an antibody that is binding a soluble ligand. So when you do have the binding of a soluble ligand by, let's go again with the same exercise, you have a drug that is not an antibody. It should not produce phagocytosis, but if you have an anti-drug antibody that's binding your drug that's bound to the ligand, you could actually have phagocytosis uh, activation. This is going to produce certain signs and symptoms of immunogenicity, of course. So this is all immunogenic response to the drug and these are all dependent on having a humoral response, an anti-drug antibody in terms of B-cell humoral response. Now, the other thing on phagocytosis is, again, the same situation when your drug is an antibody and should be causing phagocytosis and phagocyte activation. And you have an anti-drug antibody that is not neutralizing, so your drug is bound to the ligand, but it is blocking that activation of phagocytes, then you have less phagocytosis and a decrease in the efficacy of this particular drug. So this is complex because we can have several different effects of antibodies. And when your drug is an antibody, you need to make sure that you dissect in your mind all the different steps that are happening so that you can understand how to interpret the data that you are seeing. There's basically five uh, different classes of antibodies and they are defined by their constant region uh, chains uh, on the heavy chain. So we have the IgG class, the IgE class, the IgD, IgM, IgA. 
there are features of each of them that are characteristics of these different classification. And you can actually read a lot more in detail uh, about the different features and functions of these particular FC portions. So now we are talking about the function of the FC portion, which is the constant region of basically the heavy chain, and that's outside the antibody binding site. So going back to the interpretation of neutralizing antibodies or loss of function, they can actually be detached. You can have loss of function even if you don't have a neutralizing antibody. So when we spoke about the different functions of the uh, FC portion of the antibodies, it is important to identify that on the FC region, there are five subclasses of IgG. Uh, there's the IgA, IgM, IgD, and IgE isotypes. And the ability to produce antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity is more prominent with the IgG1, IgG3 subclass. The other isotypes will not actually have the ability to engage through the FC receptors, the killer cells or the effector cells in the ADCC function. The complement dependent cytotoxicity is going to be basically triggered with uh, isotypic antibodies that are of the IgG3, IgM, IgG1, and to a lesser extent, IgG2 and IgA. So some of these isotypes will not be able to activate the complement cascade. And finally, for the antibody-dependent cell phagocytosis, what you see here is that basically all IgGs can potentially also induce phagocytosis as well as IgA antibodies, whereas other isotypes like IgM, D, and E will not have that effect. So this is important to know only when you have a drug that is an antibody, because that's the one you know for sure which is the isotype. So when you have a drug that's an antibody, you know the isotype and you know what the likelihood of that particular isotype having any one of these activities through the FC portion is. And you characterize that uh, in vitro so that you can follow if this is part of the mechanism of action or if this is something that you want to make sure you avoid, uh, so then it depends on what, what is the kind of isotype that your drug is. And in all of the package inserts, when you are prescribing a drug for a patient or if you're doing research, you should know what isotype is the drug. And this is going to tell you some information about uh, potential effects of that drug. The complication is when you have anti-drug antibodies because, uh, you know, they could block the effects of your antibody drugs if you are expecting these antibody drugs to have any of these FC portion effector functions. Uh, but it, it also depends on the antibody, the anti-drug antibody isotype. And that is idiosyncratic. We have no idea. It's most likely polyclonal or maybe oligoclonal response to the drug. So we could have a mix. Each individual is forming an antibodies to the drug and we do not have control on what is that isotype. So that isotype could easily be one that engages equally well these functions as your drug is expected to do and then basically even though it's binding there it may actually not have an effect on on 
the expected efficacy. On the other hand, if the individual is mounting an immune response with anti-drug antibodies that are of a different isotype class from your drug, uh, the effect that you would be expecting that particular isotype to have may be blocked. On the other hand, when your drug is not an antibody, uh, we really cannot, we've, and we have anti-drug antibodies, we cannot really anticipate what the human isotype of that anti-drug antibody is going to be in all of the individuals treated. So we cannot expect uh, to know if we have to test for one or another. But in part three of this series, I'm going to discuss how to generally look at the signs and symptoms that are important and why do we need to follow all of these special potential effects of an anti-drug antibody. Even when your drug is not an antibody, you can have, quote, antibody effects because of your anti-drug antibody. Um, one function of the FC portion of antibodies is actually uh, binding receptors that we have in the liver. These are actually called uh, the FC neonatal receptors, and we all have them. Humans uh, have them. I don't know if other animals do, now that I mention humans. Well, anyway, so humans have these receptors. And basically what's going to happen is on a first stage, uh, these neonatal FC receptors will identify the isotype on the IgG molecule. These are very specific IgG. They bind the neonatal receptor. And what happens is they go into the endosome together with other serum proteins. And as you can see there, the function of the endosome is to bring those other proteins to the lysosome for degradation. But what happens with everything that was bound to the FC neonatal receptor, which were our IgGs, they are not going to be sent to the lysosome for degradation. They go on a third step into a recycling endosome and eventually go back into the blood. So in other words, there are some IgG isotypes and subclasses that bind stronger to the FC neonatal receptor in our liver, and this increases the uh, half-life of that particular antibody that we have in the blood. So the important thing about here is that if our drug is an antibody, we should know which IgG isotype it is, and we should have an idea of how this particular binding to the neonatal receptor is, Im is impacting and increasing the expected half-life of that drug. So we could have a drug that actually has been engineered to bind the FC neonatal receptor uh, with more affinity and be recycled more times. And in, in other words, we have a prolonged half-life of that particular drug. Or we can have drugs that bind with not so much uh, length, but there are still different half-lives of the drugs have a lot to do with this particular natural recycling that we have. If we have an antibody to the drug, and this particular antibody to the drug is an antibody to an IgG antibody, it could be blocking this binding to the neonatal receptor. And it could decrease the recycling and decrease the half-life. It could also be binding the IgG, but depending on the anti-drug antibodies, which we don't control, these are idiosyncratic, and each individual will mount an Ig response that is different. So if an individual is mounting a response with anti-drug antibodies that actually bind this neonatal receptor with more affinity, 
uh, we could potentially be seeing an increase in the half-life of that particular, either the drug bound to the antibody, but definitely of this antibody in the drug, the anti-drug antibody. So it is very complex because this particular mechanism could be affected one way or another. Normally, if your drug is not an antibody, this particular metabolism doesn't play a role. But again, if you have anti-drug antibodies, they happen to be tightly bound to the drug when they get to the liver. And if they have the ability to bind the FC neonatal receptor, they could be recycling the antibody and the drug into the system. So these anti-drug antibodies, either if they are two drugs that are antibodies or drugs that are not, can have more or less binding to the FC neonatal receptors that can produce a perpetuation of an anti-drug antibody, not necessarily uh, forever. You know, it just prolongs that uh, amount of time that you should be expecting to see the test positive in an individual for the anti-drug antibody. So it could be recycling that anti-drug antibody and, and increasing the half-life. Uh, or uh, they could potentially also be impacting how your drug, if your drug is an antibody, how your drug is normally metabolized and it can actually increase or decrease the PK based on this function of uh, FC neonatal receptor recycling. So I want to summarize the uh, potential effects of anti-drug antibodies that we have reviewed uh, in, in the talk of part one of interpretation of immunogenicity and it's basically for clinical interpretation at the very end. But this part one was basically uh, what are the elements that mount a B cell response and what should we be considering when we look at results. So because anti-drug antibodies are antibodies, they have an FAB, uh, an antigen binding site, and an FC, which is a crystallizable fraction. If the therapeutic drug is endogenous and we have this antibody, the antibody via its FAB its antigen binding site uh, can actually have long-term consequences if this anti-drug antibody not only binds your drug, but if your drug is a uh, homologous of an endogenous target. So if you have uh, insulin and you have anti-drug antibodies, they could potentially be reacting with natural insulin from a patient. Um, same happens with any kind of endogenous drug. So this is something that is very important. I think I did mention in other parts of my talks that you could have a very uh, low frequency for a particular anti-drug antibody to be present in a given drug, but the consequences could be tremendous. So this is what you need to understand in your particular system that you're working on. Is the drug that you're using endogenous? Uh, even if the probability of having anti-drug antibodies are low, you need to make sure how are you going to follow up uh, the patient or how you're going to interpret the data if it's in a study to make sure that if there are anti-drug antibodies, how do you make sure that you can characterize if they are reacting with endogenous target and what are you going to do if that's the case and what kind of safety surveillance you need to have for your patient or for the particular study. Now, if you have anti-drug antibodies to a protein that is not an antibody, the FC portion of the anti-drug antibodies can trigger phagocytosis, antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity, and complement-dependent cyto cytotoxicity. And this is especially if the endogenous target is a surface target and then your antibody is bound to it. So normally, if you're and if your drug uh, 
is an endogenous target, is not an antibody and binds the cell membrane, it should never produce any of these effects. Phagocytosis, ADCC and CDC are only triggered by FC portions of an antibody. So normally your drug would not have any of these effects. Uh, in my talk, part three of immunogenicity interpretation, I will be explaining a bit about the different types of hypersensitivity associated with these effects that we need to follow up in the clinic or analyze in studies, uh, either if our drug is an antibody or not. And finally, remember that also if the antibody to the drug has a particular FC isotype, it can bind the FC neonatal receptors and it can produce a persistence of those anti-drug antibodies for a longer time than expected. If your therapeutic drug is a, an antibody, you need to do a, a bit more of thinking. I always think about uh, mirrors that are looking at each other, facing each other. Um, you need to angle one of them at least so that you can see better what is real, what's happening here. Uh, we have two antibodies. One is the drug, one is the anti-drug antibody. So what could happen? Via the antibody binding site, the anti-drug antibody can affect the monoclonal antibody FAB, so it could be a neutralizing antibody. It could directly bind the functional site of the drug. But it can also bind the FC part of your drug. And in that case, it can impact the ADCC, the CDC, and the phagocytosis effects of your drug. So if your drug binds, if your antibody binds a membrane receptor and it's expected to produce antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity, complement-dependent cytotoxicity and or phagocytosis depending on your drug's Ig isotype, if that is normally what you would expect as mechanism of action, an anti-drug antibody to the FC portion could be decreasing the efficacy by reducing the ability of the drug to have these effects. Now, your particular drug may have been engineered to have less uh, ability to mount these kind of FC dependent functions. And if your drug doesn't have this particular isotype, we do not control what the anti-drug antibody's isotype is. That is idiosyncratic and it's each individual will mount different immune responses. So if a particular individual happens to mount an immune response with an isotype that has a high probability of engaging the antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity, the complement-dependent cytotoxicity, and phagocytosis, any of these or all of these, could now be seen in situations where you were not expecting this. So this would be similar to when your drug is not an antibody and you're not expecting to see these results. Bottom line is we do not know what the individual is going to mount in terms of the B-cell response, what kind of isotype that's going to be. But on part three of the clinical interpretation series that I have, I will go over the clinical manifestations we do need to follow up and we need to analyze. I would assume that if needed, uh, there are ways of uh, testing these particular responses, but uh, for individual case-by-case -case situations, it may not actually be necessary, it might be much more useful to look at the individual clinical picture. Uh, via the FAB of the anti-drug antibody, they can actually bind the drug's FC portion and affect the clearance via the FC 
neonatal receptor. So this is another way that the anti-drug antibody can increase or decrease the uh, half-life of the drug. And even if it's not decreasing or increasing the mechanism of action via either FAB or the FC functions of cytotoxicity, it could increase or decrease the amount of time the drug is in the blood and ultimately affects efficacy uh, one way or another and also can have an impact on safety. Now, the anti-drug antibodies also have an FC portion. And independently of where the FAB is binding the drug, this FC portion of the anti-drug antibodies could also trigger those, you know, phagocytosis, antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity, and complement dependent cytotoxicity. If the endogenous target or the target of our drug is a surface target, so it's bound to the surface, and our drug may not be uh, producing those effects, but the anti-drug antibody could be of an isotype that triggers that phagocytosis. So that's also an important thing to consider that via the FC, the anti-drug antibody can trigger those. And finally, also because the anti-drug antibody is also an antibody via its FC portion, it can be uh, binding to the neonatal receptor in the liver and cause a persistent of those anti-drug antibodies for a much longer time than it should normally be. It prolongs the half-life of an antibody. Part five is basically conclusion and the next steps. So we've been covering the general principles for the clinical interpretation of immunogenicity. So for this talk about clinical interpretation of immunogenicity, I mention the general principles that covered basically introduction. What is immunogenicity? And I wanted to start by giving you some uh, mistakes that I have seen that is important to call out to avoid making those mistakes when interpreting the data on immunogenicity, but also understand the data. Uh, to avoid the mistakes, you first have to understand it. And to do that, we talked about what is the immune response to drugs and antigens, which basically is not much different uh, than any kind of other antigen. We have the innate and the adaptive immune responses, and we have different timings and the different features of the innate and the adaptive immune responses. So both of them can play a role when we have an immune response to drugs, which we call immunogenicity. Now, the B cell response to drugs as antigens is perhaps better understood than the innate response or the T cell response. So I went on to explaining a bit more about what is the B cell response in general, which is no different when the drug is an antigen. Um, and you, have, you could have primary or secondary responses and how to interpret the titers of the anti-drug antibodies and the isotypes. Uh, finally, we also covered what is that you need to understand about antibody structure and function and how the antibodies have several functions outside from the antigen binding site. And if you have an anti-drug antibody uh, that could be binding different parts of the drug, it, it could have different implications in terms of the function of that anti-drug antibody. Now, if your drug is an antibody and you have an antibody to the antibody, it becomes a bit more complex. So I hope the explanations were useful. You can come back to the YouTube channel and see them and paste them uh, so that you can try to dissect what's happening if you have a patient that may be having an anti-drug antibody response. Uh, so the conclusions are make sure that you understand the data, make sure that you remember your basic science in terms of immunogenicity and immune system responses. And then I wanted to just mention the next steps. There is another talk on clinical interpretation of immunogenicity. In this case, is how to understand the antibody assay. I didn't go through that here because it was already a very long talk. But you need to understand 
uh, what are the false positive, false negatives, how, how is the antibody assay generally done, how you can interpret what you may be getting in the lab for a particular patient. And finally, immunogenicity guidelines. Uh, the guidelines currently from regulatory agencies, especially the European Medicines Agency and the Food and Drug Administration, are very good at following the clear path on what do we do if we have this information? How do we actually look at it from a perspective of a population or from an individual? And how are we going to be able to look at all the data and provide a very good answer to a patient that may be coming with a question, should I be taking this drug or not? I had a, a test in the past, and I may be having anti-drug antibodies, so that you can answer in the correct way, but also you can interpret correctly the package inserts and instructions for use for the different drugs available. Or if you are in clinical research, that you can actually design your clinical studies uh, the best way to be able to interpret the data correctly. So obtaining the data and observing the data the correct way is the best way forward to making sure that you get the whole picture on clinical interpretation of immunogenicity. To create these slides, I used many different references, but there's a few that I'm putting right here for you. Um, but of course, you can see other YouTube channels uh, for explanations, or you can look at the many, many different publications available. But I just wanted to acknowledge the ones that I've been using to create these talks. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please like and subscribe to my channel for future um, notifications when I post another video. Thank you very much.